Hello, sunshine. I'm Alexi Lawless, and welcome to the State of the Union podcast, where we look at the beautiful game on and off the field through the lens of red, white, and blue colored glasses. This episode, we'll be talking, well, to the legendary Taylor Twellman, uh, UCL Roundup, MLS Playoff Structure, Liverpool Implosion, uh, My Bodyguard, Manufactured Parody, the Women's World Cup Qualifying Process, Crystal Dunn, and so much more. But first joining me, as always, my friend, my colleague, my guiding light, David Mossy, a soccer savant and a Fox soccer researcher and writer extraordinaire. Mossy, how you doing on this uh, Wednesday, February 22nd in the year 2023? Uh, doing well. Trying to sit up a little bit. My posture has been a big topic of conversation in the uh, message boards. Yeah. Uh, so what I have learned from being on air or any type of uh, you know appearance where you're on camera is that people will not only judge you and critique you, but they will diagnose you. And so don't take it with a grain of salt. But as soon as you go on air, they're going to say, hey, you know, did you get that checked out? And what's the problem over there? And why is this that way? And why are you hunched over? And so I think you're getting a little bit of that. Your, your posture in general, to me, is fine. I mean, it's not as if you're walking around, you know, uh, with uh, a hunchback or anything like that. So I think I think you're fine, whether you're standing up or whether you're at the desk. But don't don't let the turkeys get you down, my friend. Uh, did you watch anything or into anything? What's going on? Uh, I finished the Mossad book, so Ooh. I've had Israeli spies on the brain. So my father recommended a Netflix show, The Spy, starring Sasha Baron Cohen, which came out a couple yes. years ago, Yes, in which he played Eli Cohen, a famous Israeli spy in the 60s. And uh, I've, it's six episodes. I've watched four of the six. I'm loving it. I'm going to watch the final two tonight. I mean, it's, it's always interesting when you see a comedic actor who we always associate with comedy. Jim Carrey kind of did this this turn. And, you know, the great ones ultimately are just good actors and, and times great actors, and they can do it both. But it's not, I mean, <laughs> when you see him on screen, you immediately think Borat. And yet that trick that Jim Carrey and Robin Williams and others that, uh, have done, it's pretty It's pretty amazing. Uh, so you were watching that. You're, you mentioned your father. We're going to bring him up later because your father is all over this uh, this podcast. And I love that your father listens and has critique and and offers his uh, his opinions. We're going to bring that up uh, here in a little bit. Uh, let's see what did I watch? Uh, I, I told you that I have I'm on this kick now where I'm going back and watching older movies. I mean, for me, they are in the prime of when I was watching a lot of movies uh, in those in, in the '80s ish type of thing. And this one came out in 1980. It was called uh, it was called My Bodyguard, and it's. I'm telling you, it's. It still holds up. Uh, stars Chris. Uh, Chris makes make peace. I think his name was, and um, Adam Baldwin. And you won't know these actors necessarily. I mean, Chris uh, doesn't even act anymore. You might know Adam Baldwin. I think he's 60 years old and he's been in a million different things. Uh, it, it's just really, really good, and I think it really holds up. And I think it's a wonderful look into adolescence. It's not you know, ridiculously, you know, it's not inappropriate or anything like that, but there is a lesson and this, you know, this kid basically goes to this school where he gets picked on and bullied and he ends up basically hiring this big classmate that he has to protect him and others that are being extorted by the other bully in the school played by Matt uh, Dillon. By the way, a very young Matt Dillon and a very young John, uh, Joan Cusack who's in it. But it holds up. It was wonderful. I didn't think it was going to hold up as well as it does, but it's got that, even though it was 1980, it's got that gritty 1970s type of feel to it that I that I just love. Uh, and so my body guard, that's what I, that's what I watched. Um, we have a, uh, a really interesting show. You ready to light this candle? Let's do it. All right. We are going to start right off. We're not going to bury the lead because when you have a guest like Taylor Twillman, you go right to him, a legend when it comes to uh, American soccer on and off the field. And uh, he has just uh, turned over a new leaf, shall we say, with uh, going over to Apple. And we got all sorts of questions to ask the great Taylor Twillman. So without further ado, our interview with Taylor Twillman. All right, as I live and breathe, our good friend Taylor Twellman. Hey, buddy, how are you? You look great. Your head is still gigantic. Uh, your hair yes, is wonderful. Is. Uh, thank you for joining us here on the State of the Union podcast. All sorts of interesting stuff and wonderful stuff going on in your life. First off, congratulations on 
uh, a you know you you're my friend you're my colleague uh, we had a long time at ESPN together you were uh, and still even though you're not there anymore I, I would still consider you the face of ESPN so congratulations on a wonderful run at ESPN but also congratulations on this move to Apple and being the uh, the lead face and voice when it comes to the Apple production of Major League Soccer so congratulations on doing that how are you feeling about this move? Uh, I'm pretty pumped. First off, uh, the best part about cutting the cord, Big Red, is you and I get to uh, have some fun again. So this is awesome. Obviously, um, Alexi, it's been an interesting move for me. You know how important ESPN was to me in trying to break down some barriers and doing other sports and having the ability to do so. And I worked really hard at that. But my man, you you know me as well as anyone, and you taught me that there's nothing better than uh, doing something you're passionate about. And I'm as passionate about as anything regarding Major League Soccer and where this league's going to go with the World Cup coming here in 26, with Copa America in 24. Buddy, the next three and a half years, my word, this is going to be a rocket ship to the moon with the sport in this country. All right, what can folks expect when it comes to Taylor Twelman? Because you are you're you're outspoken in a wonderful way. You're entertaining. You're at times controversial. Uh, you speak from the heart. And the reason why I ask this is because when. When all the hoopla came out about you moving to mm-hmm. Apple, you know, you did the press releases, you did the press conferences, and you specifically talked in pretty much every interview I saw uh, where you said that you now have, and I want to make sure I quote this right, the ability to unapologetically cover Major League Soccer. And, you know, I came back at you uh, at one point on Twitter and mm-hmm. said, I've never felt like I've had to apologize for loving or covering MLS. And it's a little unfair to you because I, I do understand to a certain extent where you're coming from, but can you mm-hmm. expound on that a little bit? Why you feel like the shackles are off and you can talk with much more breadth and freedom than you've had in the past? Yeah, I, I think it's less about what I'm going to do on screen it's more about what i have to do off screen and alexi there may be only one person in the world that understands what i'm talking about and that was you because you worked at espn for a long time and now you work at fox every domestic network in our country we've had to beg scrap claw for any kind of coverage regarding our sport but more importantly major league soccer and so when i talked in that moment about being able to unapologetically cover it was exactly that I'm not going to change. I haven't been asked to change. I've never had to apologize. First off, I've never had to apologize for loving the league, but I've had to apologize to say, hey, give me screen time here. Give me air time here. I would love to talk about this. I think I can actually help us grow this league. Can you give me 30 seconds, 90 seconds to two minutes? That's what I'm talking about. So it's just more about the platform that Apple is saying to Major League Soccer and saying, listen, we have the same ambition, we have the same resources, and we have the same goals to grow the league. That is what I meant by saying unapologetically is now I don't have to really waste any energy behind the scenes of asking, can we cover Major League Soccer, please, at a little bit more of a higher level? Now I don't have to do that. And Taylor, you're going to be working with Jake Ziven, who Alexi and I know well. So you've gone from somebody who pretended to care about MLS and John Champion to someone who actually cares about it in Jake Ziven. <laughs> That's unfair to John. How many people left 25 years in Europe to actually come back, come back, come over here and do that? So John Champion has actually, to your point though, this is a great, it's a great conversation because John Champion had done the EPL, he had done Champions League. For what was it? I think 26, 27 years. And at that stage of his career, he had been over. Alexi was at ESPN when he did the 2014 World Cup with us at ESPN. And he was very intrigued about where the league was growing, where it was going, the infrastructures and all that. So he took a chance. He loves this league. He still lives in Boston. Um, But I'm intrigued to work with Jake Zivin. Uh, it, It is someone that I've admired at the local level. It is someone that... Obviously, Portland is a huge market. Uh, they What they did with John Strong and how he used that to make the move to where you guys are at Fox. Jake Sivan is another one. Everyone at ESPN and Fox and other networks in this country had him on their radar. I don't know if Jake's intrigued to work with me, but I'm intrigued to work with Jake, to say the <laughs> least. All right. So, so when we do see you 
talking. And uh, you will be actually getting on a plane and coming out here towards us because the uh, LA Galaxy and LAFC game, I think you're working that. So we look forward to hear, hearing and seeing you on that. What What are we going to, I guess, give us some... You know, I, I, there's a million different stories for this new MLS season and this really interesting and unique MLS season here. What are first and foremost on your mind in terms of the things that people should be watching on and off the field as we go through this year? Well, first off, the Rose Bowl game apparently is going to be played in a blizzard because Los Angeles somehow <laughs> has turned into the Northeast. Uh, Alexi, honestly, it, it's interesting to me. The last five years, we've had five different Supporters Shield winners and five different MLS Cup winners. And you know this league better than me. You founded this league, and you were there from the beginning. The, this league thrives on parity. I'm intrigued if LAFC can defend anything. Because if they're going to be successful in multiple ways, Alexi, they will be the first team in MLS history to play over 64 games in a calendar year. You've got CONCACAF Champions League. You've got Leagues Cup. You've got Open Cup. Obviously, the regular season that's going to be intriguing because obviously what Steve Toronto did in his first year, you look at what they did winning the supporter shield, then backing it up, winning the best MLS cup, arguably we've ever seen on your network there at Fox. I, if they can repeat at anything, they've may they may have trumped the quote unquote parody and they may have set the standard for how to really go about this. And it may mean changing your team every six months. I think that's at the top. That's at the foremost of my mind. Is LAFC going to be capable of repeating in either the Supporter Shield or MLS Cup? And if they don't, do they go all in and try to win Leagues Cup and, and, and CONCACAF Champions League? Because when it is announced, the bonus money for the Leagues Cup, it is going to blow people away at how important that is going to be for franchises in Major League Soccer and clubs in League MX. What do you mean? Well, what, uh, Break some news here. What's it going to be? What do you think? It's the largest prize money we've ever had. Yeah, in what is it? Come on, man. Don't, don't tease America. us like that. All, I'm teasing it because I learned it from you. You throw a tease out there. You let it simmer for a little bit, and then we'll find out later on. Good for you. Good for you. Now, Taylor, you played in an era when the Galaxy was the marquee franchise in MLS. You lost a couple awesome. of no, lost a couple of MLS yeah, Cups to them, that's including awesome. including that's one in 2002 awesome. in which you came up against Alexi Lalas. When you think about that was in his pocket, actually. Yes. When you think about what the Galaxy have been the last few years, the frustration of the fans, the way it boiled over this offseason, especially in light of the emergence of LAFC, what are your thoughts on the LA Galaxy as a franchise right now? I appreciate that. Uh, I'm surprised you guys don't have highlights of me uh, sitting in Alexi's uh, pocket for about 90 minutes as he reminds me every six months about that. Listen, uh, it's a great question. I, we did a few little previews for Apple TV, and one of my teams to preview was the LA Galaxy. And I know they hate this, but I'm all, uh, I'm all for the angst and the anxiety and the anger they have right now. The, the LA Galaxy supporters, rightfully so, have every reason to be upset. And the biggest reason why is you've got a team that's come into Major League Soccer right down the road and completely blown the doors off of that. And I get the LA Galaxy all in all in the head-to-head matchups may have the upper hand, but make no mistake about it. When I land at LAX and I go downtown, I don't see any LA Galaxy flags. I don't see any LA Galaxy anything. And this is the prim- this is the most storied franchise in Major League Soccer. They've won more MLS Cups than anyone they have been fan- they, they were a thorn in my side when I played. They were the peak. They were what everyone wanted to aspire to be. And in their own backyard, you can make a real argument right now that they're second. And so that has to chap the rear ends of all the LA Galaxy supporters. They're upset right now. And I think they have every right because they are going to put pressure on that franchise to turn the corner because their bitter rivals right down the road just literally won the supporter shield and had the best performance in MLS Cup in the greatest game in Los Angeles. And there's a real argument that the team that LA, that, that David Beckham and Landon Donovan and Robbie Keane and Bruce Arena, that was a team so long ago that people have forgotten about it. All right, chapter your ends of the uh, Galaxy Faithful. Uh, okay, <laughs> uh, we are recording this, uh, as we said, on uh, Wednesday, February 22nd. Uh, news coming out, <laughs> I mean, literally just a couple of days before the season starts, about the playoff format. Your thoughts on this, and keep in mind that they're now going to, 
uh, not to not to get too deep in the weeds here, but they're actually going to a th- best of three game uh, when it comes to the playoffs. And so again, the playoff format has changed. Is this good? Is this bad? Are you indifferent to it? Uh, I, at some point, you've got to pick a you got to pick a play playoff format and, and stick with it. You just have to. And so I've said this, Alexi, for the last couple of years. I will not judge the playoff format until they're done expanding. Because I, I, it's changing every time a team comes in. I understand the thinking that the higher seeds deserve more of an opportunity to advance, and that's why you have the best of three. But, Alexi, I was against the one-off. I was for home and away. The one-off playoff format was fantastic. I don't know what you guys mm-hmm. think, but it it was exciting. It was life, life or death. It was there for the taking. I loved everything about it, and I was against it. I was like, no, this isn't going to work. You should stay traditional. You got to have the home and the way. You got to do away goals, all of that. I And I got that wrong. I don't know. You know, I struggle with 60% teams making the playoffs, but I understand the thinking that in the one-offs, the higher seeds were not advancing. And when you look at the analytics – now the lower seeds, if they are in the play-in, are now going to have to play, if I'm not mistaken, what is it, four games in 12, 13 days. So the odds are against the lower seeds advancing. I get it. I just don't know if that's the right formula because they proved me wrong in the one-off playoff games. So I'm I'm kind of not really for it if I had a gun to my head. Yeah. But I also was wrong on the one-off games. Yeah, and – you know, if if your goal is to make it unpredictable, then careful what you wish for, right? Some of that unpredictability actually makes it interesting. Look, you brought up uh, expansion, uh, so so keep in mind, Taylor Tolman, a, a proud uh, man from uh, St. Louis. Congratulations, by the way, to your uh, St. Louis City SC coming into the league uh, here. And I know that you and your family and your father are very very excited. Uh, I saw your father when I actually went out and visited. Uh, uh, St. Louis. So how do you think that's going to go? And then further, uh, Don Garber today uh, was talking about Vegas, San Diego, Sacramento, Tampa Bay, Detroit, and Phoenix. Who's next in line? And then where does this stop, Taylor? Or does it stop? That's a great question. That's a great question. First off, St. Louis is just, uh, uh, Alexi, to survive a pandemic, inflation, and everything else, I still have to tip my cap to what the Taylor family did. They put their mo- they put their money where my mouth has been for 30 years, bragging about St. Louis, telling anyone and everyone in American soccer landscape, if you are going to have a league with 25 plus teams, you're telling me you're not going to be in St. Louis. And the Taylor family listened to that. They put real money, a billion dollar complex, the only one in MLS where the training facility, team office, and stadium are all downtown. Alexi, you saw it. It's unique. There's some character to it. Uh, I don't know what to expect about what's on the field, Alexi. I really don't. Uh, I have been completely open. I'm not a huge fan of the Red Bull way. They went out and got Bradley Carnell. Uh, That's the kind of style of play you're going to have. I don't know. Sometimes that system can get you results when you least expect them to. Um, They haven't spent a ton of money on the roster, and that's because I think a lot of it was building the stadium and everything else with inflation. The cost went up, and so they had to do this step by step. But, Alexi, they have 35,000 season ticket holders on the wait list. They sold out the stadium in six minutes. Six minutes, dude. 63,000 people in St. Louis bought season tickets. What? what like, I, didn't, I would have never said that. I would have said maybe 25, 30, maybe it would be awesome. 63,000. They're going to have a pep rally the night before the home opener. 25,000 people are going to show up. So I, I, I don't know what to expect. All I know is – the most important part to St. Louis will be the fans. It can't be a cheese and wine crowd. They need to be loud. They need to be vibrant. And they need to show what St. Louis has been about for the last 60, 70 years. To go back to your to second part of your question, and I think it's the most important one, is that who's the 30th team and does it stop? I will be stunned at what Tom Penn and those down in San Diego are trying to pull off if they're not the 30th team. Vegas right now if you read the tea leaves, it looks like the Oakland Athletics are looking at Las Vegas and they're more than likely going to find a way to get a stadium done. I haven't heard anything about Las Vegas in a soccer-specific stadium. I haven't heard anything. I've heard a lot about San Diego in the last three or four months. Now, 
I know Vegas is very, very, very intriguing in the sports landscape, but Alexi, since 1996, and quite honestly, since the 1994 World Cup, you talked about what markets? St. Louis? San Diego was always brought up, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, Sa- San Diego was always brought up in where they love soccer, the San Diego soccers, what they've done. I think the, 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 the NWSL team has surprised a lot of people at how quickly they had success. So if you're asking me right now on what is it, February 22nd, who's going to be the 30th team? I think I'd be stunned if it's not San Diego. Uh, Taylor, shifting gears a little bit, MLS is maybe the only league that can cite both incoming transfers and outgoing transfers as evidence of growth. It seems to me like it's a selling league when it comes to Americans and a buying league when it comes to foreigners. Is that how you see it? And what do you make of the place that MLS currently occupies in the global transfer market? It's a great question. It's honestly a great question. And I think it's one of the top three most important questions about this league and where it wants to, where it needs to go. For so many years, we all said and we wanted, for those of us that covered, for those of us that played in the league, if this league really wants to do anything, it's got to be a topic of conversation in the world market. And the only way to do so is you got to be a factor in the transfer windows. And the fact is, when Major League Soccer and the Board of Governors made the decision to become a selling league to steal the quote of Don Garber a couple years ago, now all of a sudden more eyeballs come to it in important eyeballs. And yes, you're right. A lot of it is young Americans that are in the academies that are leaving to play at higher levels. But again, now you have a piece of the pie. Now, every single time, Tyler Adams, Weston McKinney, Brendan Aronson, Paxton Aronson, Kevin Paredes, all of these players are now leaving. Guess what? Matt Turner, guess what you have to say? You have to say where they came from. So now the Premier League broadcasters that haven't had to say Major League Soccer names for so many years, every single time when you talk about the pedigree of the Eastern European, you now have to talk about the pedigree of the American player, and your name is mentioned. Your league is mentioned, and I don't care what anyone says. I think that's more that's the best marketing tool you can ever have than putting anything up on a billboard or any commercial on television because the proof is then in the pudding. Now, what's interesting is the second part of your question is I think, and this is where Copa America on Fox in 2024, it's going to be the, uh, the, it's going to be the precipice of the South American player all of a sudden realizing, because they're starting to ask questions now, they used to go to Liga MX, now they're going to say, I'm I'm going to go to Major League Soccer. Now part of that is Seattle winning CONCACAF Champions League. But when Copa America is here, all of those South American players are going to see the infrastructures, the training facilities. They're going to he- most likely see games during that time if Major League Soccer I- is smart in showcasing that. League's Cup is all of a sudden going to put a real spotlight on where the leagues are. League MX can hear and feel Major League Soccer breathing down their neck. And so now all of a sudden, you're getting the higher level player that chose to go to League MX either to get to Europe or more importantly, to reach the pinnacle of their careers, they're not going to go to Mexico. And that's a real conversation that I hear from agents, that I hear from managers and technical directors. When they're going to sign players, to your point, because of the Miguel Amarones being sold and having great success in, at Newcastle, they'd rather come to MLS and they don't want to go to Mexico. That is putting a real dent into the brand of Liga MX, but more importantly, into the wallets. All right, let's finish up with MLS here, and I want to do kind of a rapid fire at you, and then I want to move to the U.S. uh, men's national team because i got all sorts of questions for you. All right, uh, real quick, uh, you're not shy about giving predictions. These are way too early predictions. I know you're a betting man. Uh, MVP for the 2023 season in MLS. What do you got? Sebastian Jersey. Okay. Uh, MLS Cup winner. Philadelphia Union. Ooh. Uh, Winner of the Western Conference. Oh, that's a good one. Um, I'm going to say Austin. Ooh, okay. Um, winner of the Eastern Conference. Well, he said Philadelphia is going to win MLS Cup. Doesn't mean that we don't. So. Oh, regular that, season. Does it, does it, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that doesn't matter. Fair I'm going to say. I'm going to say Toronto. Toronto, really? Okay. Uh, who finishes last in the West? You're putting me on the spot. I hate you. Um, I'm going to say Minnesota United. 
Minnesota, the loons dropping. Oh, like a lead balloon. All right. And then last I, in the You know East, why I'm doing that, right? You know why I'm just doing that because Adrian Heath can then say, everyone's against us. Exactly. Everyone hates us. And it's like, <laughs> you finished 12th, Adrian. No, you didn't. All right. Last, <laughs> last in the East. Uh, last in the East, I will say, oh, boy. Um, real quick, you're asking me. I don't know that answer. Montreal. Okay, Montreal. Uh, and then my last one, uh, does Messi come to MLS? Yes. To Miami? No doubt. He ain't going anywhere else, buddy. Okay. And right. guess what? MLS is going to announce a playoff schedule and a regular season schedule of 85 games, and everyone gets Messi coming to their stadium <laughs> three times a year. <laughs> All right, before we go to the U.S., you got, you had one more uh, MLS one? Yeah, one last MLS one before we move on. If you were ranking all the domestic leagues in the world right now, where would you slot in MLS? Oh, man, you're like, uh, all right, so go top five in your, I would have it either eight, nine, or ten. Eight, nine, or ten, you know what I mean? Like, I, I don't know the exact numbers. I would have to really write them down. But I would say seven, eight, nine, ten, and it, it, anywhere in there. But you have them in the top ten. I have them in the top ten. Yes, I do. All right, and it's at Teller Twelve Minute tw uh, on Twitter. Uh, yeah, and if anyone listening <laughs> to this podcast, I'm sure Lexi, they know exactly where All to right. find. Well, that. just when you say that, you know, you're going to get it. So I wanted to make sure. All right, listen. Um, <laughs> We live in interesting times in crazy times when it comes to the U.S. men's national team. You've already mentioned this kind of ramp that we have over the next few years from a domestic league and an international perspective with 2026 looming and all of the good things that we have to look forward to. Um, I guess, first and foremost, what do you give this U.S. team under Greg Berhalter in terms of a rating after this World Cup? I don't know. I mean, to, to find rating, like, what do you want me to do? Like, is it an A, B, C, yeah, give D, it an or ABC. E? Or like, what give do you it say? an A, B, C, or, and you can do plus and minuses. So, yeah, I mean, for me, for me, it's a, it's a B. It's a B because, and, and let me let me give you the reasons why, Alexi, real quick. Okay. It, anything happened that was that special? Anything happened that was that different? Yes, you're going to say they qualified where they didn't in 2018. Okay, sure, I'll give you that. But guess what? You you went through a World Cup. Um, you got out of your group. Okay. I think that's, that, that is on some level a success, but then you completely got outplayed by the Netherlands. And then yeah, if Pulisic scores. So for me, it's a B you, you, I could argue C plus, but I'm not going higher than a B just because I don't know if anyone's going to remember the 2022 world cup other than for the Giovanni Reina and Greg Berhalter uh, shenanigans. Well, you, you brought it up. If that doesn't happen, do you think that Greg Berhalter is retained and continues on? And at this point, because it has happened, do you think he has any chance of being retained and continuing on? Are you asking if I'm making the decision or are you asking no, just in general no, what no. do I think is going to happen? Yeah, what do you think is going to happen? Or what do you think would have happened, I guess? Also. I think there would have been a very, 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 very strong chance that U.S. soccer would have retained Greg Berhalter if this doesn't happen. Or let me rephrase this. If Greg doesn't bring up that in the quote unquote off the record dinner luncheon that he had and it just went away and eventually the story came out later, but it wasn't started and done that by Greg. I, I think Ernie Stewart, U.S. soccer was quite pleased with where they were with it. So, yeah, I actually think there was a strong chance that he would be retained. Do I now? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I listening to Ernie Stewart and his recent comments with S.I., they caught me by surprise because it sure sounded like from Ernie Stewart's mouth, not mine, that they were OK, that he wasn't talking to anyone, that they weren't in any urgency to discover and look and, and, and find someone else. Uh, but for your listeners that may not have heard me before, I have been on the record for 14 years of my uh, media career. I've never felt that any manager should get a second run at the national team. I think it's better when it's fresh. And that includes for all you knuckleheads that are going to tweet me. That includes Didier Deschamps. I understand the tenure that he's had, but I just think you've got to be fresh, new players at that level need to be, they need to change their, their ideas. I think for example, Gareth Southgate had become a little stale with that talented English team. I've always been on the record and believe and I could I could be wrong, but I just think it's better to get someone new 
every four years. So you famously said uh, and asked the question rhetorically, what are we doing, right? <laughs> uh, what is the U.S. What Federation doing? doing? And so what do you see? Who are they going to hire? How does this look a year from now? And then obviously three years from now come 2026, both on and off the field, what the Federation looks like and what this men's national team looks like. Who's the Big coach? Red, you're asking me, you're, you're asking me this question. There's no, like, is there's no GM, there's no coach and there's no technical director. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Like, like, honestly, just let that sink in. The world cups in the United States, less than three and a half months or three and a half years, excuse me. And yeah. Uh-huh. Sure. We're just going to see what we're going to wait till the summer and just see what's going on. I, I don't know. I don't know, Alexi. I really do not know. Well, what if you and had if you had the you opportunity? Have, if you had the opportunity, who are you hiring? Oh, I'm going. I'm going big or go home, buddy. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna exhaust everyone. If Jose Mourinho's interested, I'm gonna. I'm gonna interview. I said this when they hired Greg Berhalter. I would have interviewed 100 people. I find out they interviewed two. Like I. I, I want to interview Alexi. I don't think U.S. Soccer knows, and I believe this. And I don't care what anyone tries to tell me about the culture. And, and and you got to understand what goes on. What, what what why is the United States any different than anywhere else? You're telling me right now, Pep Guardiola, if he was really interested, could come here. He couldn't figure out the special American way of the national team. Like, why is that the conversation? I don't understand that. It's still the same players. They got to play ten to twelve, fifteen years a year, whatever it may, fifteen times a year, whatever they come. I don't understand why. Why is there always like? three or four uh, prerequisites about what has to be and who it has to be. I would go big or go home. I would exhaust every option before I knew exactly who's interested. And that includes Tato Martino. That includes Jose Mourinho. That includes anyone that is interested in the U.S. men's national team. I want to talk to them. So if they're doing that right now, sure. But Ernie Stewart's comments in SI.com, it seemed like they're not, nah, we're good. We're just going to see how it goes with, uh, you know, the Nations League and then the Gold Cup's going to come around and we'll just see. Let's see what happens. Like, what? I, I don't get that. Uh, Taylor, let me ask you about the U.S.'s biggest star. Uh, do you think Christian Pulisic should leave Chelsea this summer? And if so, is there yes. a league or perhaps even a team that you think he's best suited for where you'd like to see him end up? I want. I, I, if I'm a U.S. men's national team fan, I need to see Christian Pulisic playing 75, 80 minutes every single game that he's healthy enough to play in. I, that's just what it is. I want to see three straight years of Christian Pulisic playing regularly. And I don't care if it's a mid-level team. I don't care. I get and, and I respect the absolute hell out of him trying to grind his way at Chelsea, one of the top 10 clubs in the world, and trying to get there. But Christian Pulisic needs to be running. and needs to be running at full tilt and be as confident as possible for what should be the pinnacle moment of his career and represent the U S men's national team in his backyard. And if that means changing leagues and playing for a team, that's a little bit lower than a Chelsea. So be it. If it's Atletico Madrid, because that is the most popular rumor that I have heard over the last 48 to 72 hours. Okay. I'm intrigued by it because Diego Simeone is going to test Christian Pulisic in a different way, but I don't want him to go there and not and play every four games. Miss me with that. And you guys can tell me if I'm wrong, but aren't we are, aren't we done by saying, okay, it's great, it's awesome. I'd rather have Pulisic playing on a mid-level team week in and week out because we've seen what it's done to Tim Ream in his career. I'd like to see Christian Pulisic doing that for three years and see what we get in 2026. I think you'll get a better Christian Pulisic, in my opinion. Amen, my friend. Uh, listen, we got to get you out of here, but my last question to you before we go is this. You... You are a champion for American soccer in terms of what it is on and off the field. You, like me and Mossy and everybody here, we understand it's not perfect. It has flaws. It has good days and bad days. It goes up and down, but ultimately it has grown incredibly. You have seen that growth. You have been part of that growth. Give me the best part about American soccer and the worst part about American soccer. You can do it in that order or the other order. The best part about American soccer is we have absolutely no idea where this thing's going to go. The worst part about American soccer is we have absolutely no idea where <laughs> this is going to go. And it, it drives everyone crazy because the American way is to go from zero to 100 in about 24 hours. And for some reason, when it comes to this sport, we want growth exponentially over a short time. 
Alexi, there was a time that wasn't that long ago where this league and this sport had barely 15 professional teams operating on some type of level. And yet here we are, you're talking to me on the eve of the, of the league where the 29th team is going to kick off. And we've got Cincinnati, Nashville, Austin, places that I would have never said ever in my life that they would have 25, 30,000, 50,000 people in Atlanta for a home opener. So, buddy, that's the worst part. It's because people think this is from zero to 100 because we did it in every other sport, but somehow we forget, well, no, every other sport's been around for 100 years. That's the worst part about it. Oh, my goodness. Uh, Well, that's something to end on there. Uh, (laughs) my, uh, My friend, thank you so much for coming on the State of the Union. Mossy, anything to say before we let him go? No, no, this is great. Uh, All right. Thanks. You're, you, you brought it, my friend, and that, uh, that's, that's why we have you on. That's why, that's why we love you, and, and that's why someone like Apple recognizes that if they are going to have this type of venture, they need somebody that comes with experience, that comes with personality, that comes with passion, and I think if you're just meeting Taylor for the first time, I think you can recognize that he comes with all of that and more. I wish you luck, and to all of the men and women uh, in front of the camera and behind the camera at Apple, we wish you luck. We are going to be right there as your colleagues when it comes to Fox with the linear part, but we look forward to what's happening. By the way, uh, I'm heading to uh, to France this weekend where I will test for the first time your Apple platform of being able to to watch it from anywhere in the world. So I will be watching you and your giant, ginormous head <laughs> at the Rose Bowl with the other 90,000 people freezing your ass off on my laptop from my hotel in Paris. So you better dance for me, young man. Oh, I'm going to do it. And I'll probably wear long underwear like everyone else at the Rose Bowl. And Masi, I am so sorry you have to do this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. There is the great Taylor Twelman. Goodbye, my friend. See you, boys. That was fun. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed our interview there with Taylor Tillman. We've got plenty of shows still left to do and plenty of things uh, to talk about. And, uh, you know, he's he is a friend. He is a colleague. And he was nice enough to come on and do the show. And we thank him uh, for that. We're going to take another quick break or actually our first quick break of the uh, of the episode. When we come back, ooh, we're going to take a look around at all of the action that happened, including the implosion of Liverpool to the delight and to the nightmare of others. Okay, welcome back. Uh, all right, listen, Mossy. We, we're we're again. We're not going to bury the league because while there were plenty of uh, uh, of games when it comes to the Champions League and the resumption of the Champions League here in, in with some big teams, I mean the big story is Real Madrid going to Anfield and coming out with a five to two victory. And this game was all over the map uh, for those that uh, that saw it, even for those that didn't. I'm sure that you heard about it. Ultimately, five to two. Liverpool comes out gangbusters. Everything is going their way. Uh, Nunez scores an incredible goal from actually a really interesting and and, and good pass from uh, Mo Salah. Back heel, wonderful. Anfield's going crazy. Um, and then Mo Salah has just given a gift uh, from Courtois uh, in, in a rare instance where he just couldn't clear it. So now it's 2 nothing. Happy days are here again. We talked even in the last pod about how Liverpool is on this upward trajectory and they're back in those happy times. And then the soccer gods conspired to say, not so fast. And your friend Vinny Jr. Uh, gets uh, a goal Beautiful, beautiful goal to make it two to one. Incredible footwork. I know we'll talk about all this in more in, in detail here, but just so everybody knows. Then another, the fates and the goalkeepers, you can't live with them. You can't throw them off a bridge. <laughs> and uh, your compatriot there, uh, mistake in the back. And Vinny Jr. gets another one off of his heel. He knew nothing about it. Now it goes into halftime 2-2. And from then, it is all Liverpool. Militao scores on a set piece. I don't know what the hell the marking is going on. We'll talk about that in a second. Benzema finally gets on the board. His first uh, Champions League goal of this uh, campaign was interesting. I didn't realize that. And then he also gets another one at at the end. And it ends up 5-2. All right, initial thoughts on this crazy game. The Real Madrid lineup was very interesting. Now... Some of the options were limited in the midfield because Truamini was out and Cruz was not fit enough to start. So he went with Camavinga as the six. Valverde is one of the three in the midfield and Rodrigo on the right wing, which on paper is a very offensive lineup. And early on, it looked like a mistake. 
Kamavinga was overwhelmed by the occasion. Real Madrid were all over the place defensively. And I was thinking to myself, boy, Ancelotti is going to be criticized here. But lo and behold, they turned it around, end up getting this great result. And Carlo Ancelotti comes out smelling like roses again. Is it... I mean, look, you lose, you lose, regardless of how you lose and you lose that badly. Because this version of Liverpool losing, even losing at home, it's not out of the realm of possibility given what has happened. But to lose lose this badly, how much is this just one of those games where Jurgen Klopp looks up to the heavens and says, well, it's just stuff that I can't account for. And how much ultimately is him? Because... Look, Jurgen Klopp, as we've said, is going to get plenty of leash. And and I think rightfully so. He is a legend. But this is not a game about what you have done before. This is a game about what are you doing now? And to quote the great Janet Jackson, what have you done for me lately? And lately, Jurgen Klopp has not gotten his team to win. How much is it Jurgen can only do so much and how much of it is is it on him? I mentioned, for example, the marking. I mean, that's a set piece where you know who is coming at you. And I, I get if you want to zone. But if you want to zone, you still have to be able to get into the zone and clear the ball out. And that, that Militao goal was insane. He was basically the only player in there, just ran to the ball and put it in the back of the net without a single bit of movement from anybody in red. Well, Jurgen Klopp is the one that keeps starting Joe Gomez, so he has to take the blame for that. And some of his midfield selections throughout the season have been questionable, so he does take some of the blame. I just think everyone is too quick to want to proclaim this the end of an era and they need a massive overhaul and these big sweeping takes. This is still a team that at at this point last season was chasing a quadruple, flirting with one of the great seasons in European football history. Obviously, this season has been a disaster. I think Jurgen Klopp has earned the right to be able to sweep this under the rug and say this was just a bad season and let me see if I can come back with a lot of these same players but make a couple of signings at the right spots and see if this is a team that can come back next season and challenge for major trophies. I still think they might be able to. Now, if we're sitting here next season at this time and next season looks like this season and now it's two years in a row of this, then, yeah, I'll be the one to say, listen, Jurgen Klopp, you've had a great run, but it might be that it's run its course. But I think right now it's a little too quick to say that. Fair enough. But would you say the same thing if Jurgen Klopp was coaching at Real Madrid right now and this was happening? So I, I, I guess my, another way to ask it is, is this relative specifically to him coaching at Liverpool? And would this happen at a Real Madrid or other places? Or would it have been like, or would it be, well, we've, you've done great things, but it's, it has run its course? Yeah, Real Madrid is a bit more cutthroat than Liverpool. I think there is a feeling that, you know, he delivered the first Premier League uh, title in the club's history, first league title in 30 years. And so you, you, he's bought himself more currency at a club like Liverpool than he would have at Real Madrid, but merely by winning certain big trophies because they're accustomed to winning trophies under any coach. So I think there is a difference. But it's not as if they haven't spent money. It's not as if they don't have talent, plenty of talent. I mean, hell, even in the middle of the season, they go and get Gakpo. So they, they, they have plenty of talent. And, you know, it's just, it's not happening. And to be fair to him, you know, someone like Virgil van Dijk, who was once this pillar, literally a pillar in the back in a good way, now is a, you know, a pylon and at times just does not look even close to what he needs to be when they were, uh, when they were at their best. Um, any way back? The only thing I'll say is... Ooh, ooh, there was a hesitation there. Yeah, this seems far too easy for Real Madrid, the way they do things in the Champions League. So you almost uh, think that Liverpool are going to score a couple of early goals at the Bernabeu, and then Real Madrid are going to pull it out. You know what I mean? It just right. seems yeah. like <laughs> the way Real Madrid usually do things, there has to be a bit of drama involved. Um, you know, plenty of individual performances to applaud. It, I mean, it, it doesn't get old, but Luka Modric, again, is just, it's its amazing what he can do. And, you know, age isn't everything because he's just a very, very smart player. But, you know, there is a a, a practical part of breaking down and your body breaking down and his economy of motion and his thought process is just incredible. Now, I mentioned uh, your father, who I know listens to this, and he had listened to our pod on Monday where we were talking about, you know, I, I, I threw out to you, would you rather have Erlen Holland, Marcus Rashford, or Mbappe? And, you know, we, we, we went through that. Now, I hear your father was a little disappointed that we did not include uh, Vinny in this conversation. 
He was. Yeah. Again, the context, we were talking about a Manchester United game and in which Ratchford scored two goals, mm-hmm. and he's been on this great run. And the way you framed it is, if this is the new normal for Marcus Rashford and he's leveled up and this is what he is now, do we need to start putting him in the conversation with Holland and Mbappe, who everybody's identified as the big two for this next generation? And we debated that. And my father heard that podcast early in the day, then watched this Liverpool Real Madrid game. And when we talked afterwards, he wondered why wasn't Vinicius part of that conversation? What say you? Uh, I would I would tell your father that I think the the dramatic change in who Marcus Rashford is as a player right now is, like I said, much more dramatic and much more marked than that of Vinny, okay? We've, we've talked about Vinicius Jr. and what he can be, and you saw in that moment, that first goal, his ability to get the ball out of his feet, his ability to take multiple touches in a very short, uh, uh, compact space, and then to do all of the, you know, the millisecond, uh, calculations to take all of those different snapshots and to still have the technical ability to curl that into the far post. I mean, that that was beautiful. That is an elite player doing elite uh, elite things. But I don't think that the way I think uh, about Vinny Jr. now has not changed dramatically since last week and necessarily since last month. And I think it has you know, the perception, whether it's the reality or not, but the perception of Marcus Rashford has dramatically changed over the last month. And by the way, Fox seized on that conversation. They put it out all over social media today, and you and I are getting lambasted on Twitter, but that's nothing. Get in line. Get in, get, get in line. But right. a couple notes on Vinicius, yeah. if I may. Um, <laughs> okay. I must admit I got this wrong. I did not think after his first three seasons at Real Madrid he was going to put it all together like this, and I'm not alone. Uh, There's a legendary Brazilian player, Tostão, who was uh, one of the stars of the 1970 World Cup winning squad. He's now the most respected analyst in Brazil. And he wrote a column this morning, I read, doing his own mea culpa and saying, I got this wrong uh, because I did not think Vinicius was going to turn out to be this good. And what's happened with this player in the last 18 months or so to go from somebody who had no end product to being as decisive as he is. He has 40 goals and 25 assists since the start of last season, so a little over a season and a half worth of games. And again, I don't want to belabor this point, but this season, nine goals in 10 games against non-Spanish opposition. He's also very good in La Liga and the Copa del Rey, but he's a bit more hit or miss there because there are days when the racism, the abuse, the toxicity that surrounds him does get in his head and knocks him off his game. He feels liberated when he gets out of Spain and plays in the Champions League or the Club World Cup, as we saw recently. I do think there is something to that. Uh, uh, Yeah, I, I, I think you're right, too. All right, so let's do it. Let's give your father what he wants. So if you can have now any of these four, are you still tanking Mbappe as number one? Yes. Okay. Me too. I think we're. Uh, I think we're still there. Uh, last uh, last episode, we said number two was still going to be Erlen Holland for both of us, right? I'm not sure about that. Well, okay. All right. For me, it's Erlen Holland and then Marcus Rashford. That's the three right now. Okay. And if you're putting Vinny into the, into the equation right now, it it's real close. But I'm going to give him the slight. I'm going to give Rashford the slight edge over Vinny. So that would be the four right there. And again, there are people on Twitter saying, you guys are overreacting to Marcus Rashford's run of form here. It's completely outside the context of the rest of his career. I I get that. But the way we're stipulating it is if this is the new normal. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's not that that can't – look, I know I say form is fallacy all the time, but – this is what the player is right now. And decisions are made relative to the, to the present and to what the future is and prognosticating what it's going to be ultimately. But right now, all we have is where he, where he is right now. So where would you put Vinny in that for? I might put him number two. Ooh. Am I being biased? So I've, you I, have I, him I, over I, Erlen Holland. Well, this is, we're going to get to the City game in a moment, okay. and this might be a separate conversation. Okay. I'm starting to fall out of love just a smidge with Erlen Holland. Do you want to wait till we get to that game and then yes. we can have that conversation? Okay, okay. but you're, but we're going to go right to that game. But you, and then you can well, talk well, about I, it. Well, let me just let's just wrap up Tuesday okay. just so we okay. go in chronological okay. order. Okay. Napoli right. also played that day. Teams. Yes, away to Eintracht Frankfurt. Uh, Napoli actually missed a penalty in the first half. Varadzkera denied by trap, but they still came away with a nice and tidy two 0 win. Osimhen and Di Lorenzo with the goals. Uh, and to add insult to injury for Frankfurt, their best player, Randall Colomani, got sent off in the second half. He is out of the second leg. So this tie is done and dusted. Chucky Lozano, by the way, started. Man of the match performance. So good. So good. That hit, cross, by the way, from Chucky is yeah. just it's mwah, just perfect. Hit the post, assisted Osiman, created other chances. Press, I mean. 
And Mexican fans were having a field day on Twitter throwing this in the face of U.S. supporters. Incidentally, no U.S. players saw the field in any of these Champions League round of 16 matches, which at a time when I've been told that Americans are really emerging and this That's is great. a great time in Yanks abroad. That's uh, great. So what do, you, what do you make of it? Well, I mean, Pul Christian Pulisic, even though he's not playing right now and he's on his way out, he does have a Champions League uh, medal. Uh, he has scored multiple goals uh, and, and more than uh, Chucky Lozano. I, I love Chucky Lozano. And I love, there, you mentioned two things. So one, his ability to take players on, and that's his first thought, and then to get the cross. And to hit crosses with purpose. Not just to hit them wildly, but to hit crosses with purpose. And we saw that. And then the other side of it is because now you're a complete player where he's high pressing and winning the ball up uh, in really, really good, advantageous uh, areas right now. Yeah, I mean, I wish he was American. But you still maintain Pulisic is the better player of the two. Yes, for now. A lot of comparing players on today's podcast. Yeah, that's okay. That's that's uh, that's uh, that's what we do. All right, now right, let's so get to it's Wednesday. It's, it's dusted. Though. Yeah, it's done and dusted. Yeah. Now let's get to Wednesday. Okay. Uh, Leipzig, Manchester City, a tale of two halves. City, the better team in the first half. They took lead through Riyad Mahrez. And then second half, Leipzig, much better. They brought in Henriks at the break and then Kunku later on. And both those guys provided a lift. They end up getting an equalizer through Vardiol. Uh, some people thought it was a foul, him climbing in the back of Ruben Diaz. I didn't think so. There you was didn't some, think so. I didn't think so. Okay. There was some controversy at the end of the game, a pretty decent penalty shout for City, uh, potential Henrik's handball. And it was weird because the game ended, everybody kind of walked off the field. From what I read, they didn't even check it. Right. And now people are looking at the replay after the fact and saying, wait a minute. That's a handball and it's a foul on the goal. You, you do Marty. think so. It, it is. In the in the VAR age, yeah, in, in, in the... <laughs> in the prehistoric times <laughs> when we were running around. No, not only was it not a, a penalty, but you actually used it. And as soon as you get up in the air, you can, there's a reason why, I bet you there's a snapshot and of Guardiol in, in the air. And look, he's, he's a big man and, he, and he's a great athlete, he can jump. But the air that he got was relative to him being able to use it like a pommel horse and you know, basically eject himself even higher into into that area, and he used the uh, the defender to propel himself higher. I mean, abs absolutely. Do I want to see those called? Not really. But if this is the age of uh, that we live in in VAR, and it's right in front of you, I don't. What I, what I don't. What I'm saying is, I don't get what your retort is. I don't get why that you say no. That's okay. I don't think it was that much contact. I don't think it's what really impeded Ruben Diaz from going up. I think Vardio had already sort of leaped over him. So somebody using your shoulders to propel themselves forward? The contact came when the ball was already kind of on Vardial's head, if you go back and look at it. It wasn't like, oh, if the hand wasn't there, Ruben Diaz would have been able to jump for it. I, I it. think okay. the die had been cast on that play. So, yeah. uh, that's I mean, at least that's how I interpret I'm not losing sleep over it. Right, right, right. Okay. I get it. But yeah, a couple things. Uh, Pep did not make a single substitution in this game, which was interesting. Left Foden on the bench, seems to have fallen out of love with him a little bit, which is interesting. Uh, and then the Holland thing is becoming an issue. Now, it's not that big of an issue. He's scored a gazillion goals this season, but he has only one in the last six games. Big and, goals, though. Big goals. Yeah. And we talked about that last episode. Too. Again, not involved today. Seemed frustrated at the end at the lack of service. Another conversation I had with my father in the drive here, I was kind of putting it on Holland. My dad was defending Holland, saying, City, they haven't adjusted fully to having a player like that. They don't cross the ball enough. They still try to <laughs> pass their way into the opposition net. Um, so, yeah, I guess there's different ways you can look at it. But I don't know. For, for a player who we've all anointed, and, you know, yeah, if you if you consume Erlen Holland just through highlights and just looking at the stat sheet and, oh, my God, he has X amount of goals and X amount of games, but just watching him – more than I ever had before, game in, game out. You do see some of the warts, the hold-up play, the combining with other players. I don't know. You're, you've always been of the mind, goals win games, and if you have a guy that scores goals at an amazing clip, then that's the most valuable commodity. Your whole MLS MVP criteria is based on that. Yep. Whoever scores in the most games is the MVP, and anybody who thinks about anything beyond that is overthinking it. I've always been a guy that's more drawn to the all-around attacking players that can create for themselves and others, the Mbappe type. So when we had that mbappe Holland debate, I've always been adamant that it's Mbappe. So I don't know. Maybe I don't know if this fits into that larger conversation. But have you? Where do you? Where are you on Holland right now? 
I am, I mean, I still love him. Obviously, I told you where he is in my pecking order of players that I would want because I still think that he is a ruthless finisher in an age where there are not a lot that are. And so the ones are even more valuable. I do think that they're, and maybe this is just to be expected, right? So he plays a certain way. It doesn't take a genius. It doesn't take Marco Rosso or anybody else to figure out how this team plays. And good teams, good defenders, good coaches out there are going to game plan. And we've, and it's not that it hasn't been attempted in the past, and sometimes there's only so much that you, uh, that you can do. Does he need to adjust? I'm talking about uh, Erlen Holland. Does he need to adjust to this team, or does the team need to adjust more to what Erlen Holland is? And as they are adjusting, are they still just being predictable and everybody figures it out? Even being predictable, it, at times it, it is still, uh, it, it's still unstoppable. But if Erlen Holland is going to be a... Lewandowski or a Klosa or, you know, insert your big number nine up there or even a Zlatan Ibrahimovic, you're going to have to show up. And Erlen Holland was not hired to score a boatload of goals in the EPL. He's going to do that no matter what. Erlen Holland was hired to bring them to the promised land. And this is your pathway to the promised land. And I think they've done enough to figure it out on the, uh, in, in the second leg, whether Aaron Holland's involved or not. But at some point in this campaign, if they hope to be champions, Aaron Holland is going to have to come good and score not just big goals, but the big goal. And that is really where he proves, proves his wealth, or proves his, uh, his ability and, pr- and proves his value going forward. So I don't know. Uh, it, you know, I don't know if I've <laughs> completely answered the question or not, but yeah, I still I still rate him, and I don't think that this is a a lost cause by any stretch of the imagination. And I still think City go through here, but Leipzig can be frisky. To me, this is not like a hundred percent that they go home. And, and second take half, just look at the second half. Yeah. I mean, it was all Man City in the first half, and it, you know, Leipzig said, "All right, well, that's as bad as badly as we can play." And you know, give a credit Man City and Pep. And in the second half. They were good, and they got their deserved goal for the way that they played, whether it was a penalty or whether it was a foul or not. But they they got that deserved goal, and so I think I still don't think it's enough. But yeah, things can happen. Uh, the other game today, Inter Milan won no winners at home over Porto. Lukaku came on for Jeco in the second half and scored the winner. It was a header off the post, and then he put in his own rebound. So a slim advantage for the Italians. Uh, we'll go back to Portugal for the return leg. This feels like one that's still in the balance. Yeah. yeah. And in Porto uh, had a man set off, right? So they were Correct. playing. Correct. Uh, Bavio. Yeah. yeah. So they were playing with 10 men. And I, I think if, I think if you're Port- Porto and you look at that game, yeah, you have to be bullish about the opportunity to go, to go back. It was fun to see Lukaku on the field and, scoring goals we haven't seen <laughs> that a whole lot over the last few years so yeah but i think i think Port, uh, porto has a really good shot at uh, overturning this uh, one note uh we're taping this on a wednesday this comes out on thursday europa league manchester united barcelona uh, the first leg at camp new was terrific ended 2-2 so they will settle that tie thursday at old trafford so that's another game to keep an eye on women's world cup intercontinental playoff action you ready to move on to that yeah I mean, I, 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 as I told you last uh, episode, I'm all over the place when it comes to Woso. Uh, all the women's soccer that's going on, getting prepared for this, uh, for this summer, and as we've said, an expanded World Cup. As we also mentioned, these are important games because, for a number of different reasons. These, uh, uh, the opportunity for these teams to qualify for the World Cup, and in the form of someone like Haiti, their first ever World Cup from a or first ever women's World Cup, and. Uh, when it comes to Portugal, that is who the U.S. is going to play because they go into the U.S.'s group in the World Cup. So I'm watching these not only for the teams that are playing, but also how it relates to what groups they're going, and in particular, Portugal against the U.S. Uh, Portugal incidentally defeated Cameroon to secure World Cup berth. As you mentioned, they joined the United States, the Netherlands, and Vietnam in that group. They'll be the U.S.'s third uh, group stage opponent. Haiti qualifying for the first time. They beat Chile. By the way, look at how Sean Sullivan spelled chili in the rundown. It's uh, he, he's hungry and he, he enjoys the restaurant. So yes, so <laughs> congratulations to Chile. So we know thirty-one of the thirty-two teams that will be in Australia, New Zealand. The last uh, 
birth by the time you hear this podcast, it might have already been decided because again, we're taping this Wednesday, releasing on Thursday. On Thursday, Paraguay takes on Panama yeah. in the final intercontinental playoff matchup. So good news, like I said, for Haiti qualifying for their first women's world cup. Another member of CONCACAF, so that's good from a CONCACAF perspective. Potentially by the time you're hearing this, Panama could have uh, gone through over Paraguay. I'm just from a CONCACAF perspective i'm looking at it and saying hey i i want i want panama uh to be there and you saw what it meant to the haitian players and to that country and the excitement of going to a world cup for the first time we've talked time and time again there's the actual playing of the game which certainly is our focus but there is so many more ripples to these teams when they qualify, when they go to a World Cup, an expanded World Cup, as it is going to be in Australia and New Zealand, and what it means for the team, for the players, for the country, for the sport, for the young girls that are watching, for the young boys that are watching, for everybody is watching. Uh, So it was fun to see them in that moment when that whistle blows, knowing that they are going to a World Cup. And, And plenty of drama, by the way, at the end. Penalties and missed penalties and all sorts of stuff in the uh, Cameroon-Portugal game, 95th minute penalty. So all sorts of craziness and drama for the opportunity to go to the World Cup. Uh, Speaking of the U.S. women's national team, they're in action as we speak against Brazil in the final game of the She Believes Cup. It is nil-nil in the 10th minute, that match being played in Frisco, Texas. So we'll keep an eye on that as we continue taping this uh, podcast. Yeah, I, uh, I think Crystal Dunn just hit one off the post there. I'm going to be talking a little bit more about Crystal Dunn yeah. later on in the, uh, in the show. But we, we mentioned how all three of these games were specifically designed to give the U.S. different looks, whether it was Japan, uh, Brazil, or Canada. Japan beating uh, Canada 3 nothing, but we know uh, that it's really, you know, it has nothing to do with what's going on on the field. It's really off the field right now, and so really you can't even read anything into the results right now, right? Although they did somehow beat Brazil, which doesn't <laughs> speak well of Brazil, <laughs> losing to a team that didn't even want to be there. Uh, I think it's just going to be a, a Marta fest when it comes to Brazil. Yes. We're not going to look so much as the results and just look at, you know, on a great finishing finishing up a career internationally, I think. On the topic of teams qualifying for World Cups, congratulations to the U.S. under-17 men's team. Uh, they defeated tournament host Guatemala 5-3 in the quarterfinals, quarterfinals of the CONCACAF under-17 championship. And by virtue of that victory, they have clinched a berth in the U-17 World Cup in Peru later this year. K. Rol Figueroa with a couple of goals. He's up to six in this tournament. He's been one of the breakout stars. He is a Liverpool youth product and the son of Honduran legend Minor Figueroa, but he plays his international football for the United States. Yes, we'll, we'll take him. You know, it's uh, it's it's the future. You know how much I love watching uh, youth soccer and development <laughs> soccer. <laughs> All right, so should we spin this forward to games coming up this weekend? Yes, because there's all sorts of interesting stuff. All right, should we start uh, over there in England? Yes. uh, In the Premier League, Arsenal will be away to Leicester. Hmm, interesting. Gabriel Jesus, medically recovered, training with the team, wanted to come back for this game. Arteta thought about it, but decided we're going to hold him out one more game, so he'll be back next week. But his return is imminent, which... Is that good or bad? I think it's good. And Ketia has gone <laughs> off the boil. So actually, the timing for Jesus to come okay. back is, is good. Uh, Manchester City away to Bournemouth. Because of the comments I just made, I fully expect Ellen Holland to score five goals in this game to yeah. make me look like an idiot. He'll run over to the sideline and grab the microphone and say, Mossy in your face. Yes. A uh, reminder, Arsenal two points clear and a game in hand. In the relegation battle uh, this weekend, uh, Leeds will host Southampton. That's 19 hosting 20. Leeds United making news. They have hired a new manager, Spaniard Javi Garcia. I'm not sure if he'll be on the bench for this game. We'll see if all the paperwork clears. The interesting thing is he accepted what Jesse Marsh did not at Southampton. Right. This is a emergency, just short-term, short-term deal with an option to extend. Right. It's 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 an opportunity. And, you know, maybe he's in a different position than Jesse Marsh is in. And he says, hey, what's the worst thing that could happen? We go down and they say, thank you for your time. And a lot of people believe that they're going down anyway. But what's the best possible thing? I find a way to immediately implement something that is going to generate the amount of points to save you at the end. And I end up looking like the hero. I get a three-year deal. And off we go. Uh, your comments regarding Tyler Adams and Wesson McKinney trying to be tough guys got a lot of play. Any, really? Anything you want to add to that or you feel comfortable with what you said? 
I always feel comfortable with what I say. It's why I say, it's why I say it's, it doesn't mean that people aren't going to be angry or, or critical or disagree. That's, that's fine. That comes with, the, comes with the territory. So I stand by what I said. And they're wonderful players, and I'm glad that they play for the, for the U.S. And I, I also explained. So, so here's what happens. You know, I love the men and women that work uh, on, this, on this show, but you know, we also we have to take clips. And the clips are whatever the clip is, whatever the amount of seconds is, it is. And sometimes there's context, sometimes there isn't context. And it's by design. I get it. It's, uh, it's totally okay. But, you know, when, when the headline is that I am taking them to task for the physical nature that I think and is unnecessary. And that in and of itself is a headline. And it's absolutely what I said. But I also say why... I understand that they are doing that, and why I still uh, why I still love them. But you gotta you know you gotta click on the link, and you have to watch the show or listen to the show. And we appreciate those that uh, those that do to get the full context. And just because you don't do that or don't click on it, doesn't mean that I'm saying that you shouldn't you know take me to task because this is what we're putting out, and it doesn't mean that everybody has the full context or has watched uh, or listened to the whole show. It's just uh, it's just the way that it is. But for the record, I love Weston McKinney and I love Tyler Adams. I would want them on my team, and I'm glad they they are doing well and uh, you know uh, playing in the EPL. And they have a wonderful career ahead of them, a wonderful lifetime ahead of them, and hopefully uh, a wonderful career when it comes to the U.S. Fair enough. Uh, we will hand out a trophy in England this weekend. Manchester United will face Newcastle at Wembley in the League Cup final. A reminder, the Newcastle goalkeeper situation is interesting. Nick Pope suspended because of the red card he picked up against Liverpool in the Premier League. Dubravka, the backup, is cup-tied because, ironically enough, he was loaned to Manchester United earlier this season and played for them in the League Cup. Wait, which cup is this? Which one's this? This is the League Cup. So this not, is not the FA not Cup. Not the FA Cup. It's the other one. So it appears... The Cup? Yeah. Is that a different one? No, that's right. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Loris Karius, it sounds like, will start. He's the third stringer, right. which uh, very apropos in a week in which Liverpool and Real Madrid squared off and there were goalkeeping blunders in the game that Loris Karius is back in our lives. Uh, he will likely get the start for Newcastle as they face Manchester United. Uh, moving to Germany, where we have a great title race on our hands, Bayern, Union Berlin, and Dortmund all on 43 points. Entering mm. this weekend, Dortmund away to Hoffenheim. A reminder, Hoffenheim, managed by an American, Pellegrino Matarazzo, took over recently. They also feature John Brooks across the back line. We'll see what Dortmund can do there. We'll see if Gio Reyna gets himself on the field, maybe goes up against John Brooks. And if you, if you need a reason, and, you know, you should need a reason, because the Bundesliga, while you know, we have certainly f followed it and talked about it, and I think it holds a place relative to other leagues, in particular the EPL, it, it's not always top billing. And a lot of that comes from the fact that Bayern Munich just kind of at, at a certain point runs away, and it's very, very predictable. That's not the case right now. And as we've said time and time again, this actually a couple of weeks ago was kind of around the point where in normal times, Bayern Munich would have kicked on and restored order to that Bundesliga. And that's not the case. We do have a title race here. Doesn't mean that Bayern Munich can't kick on and win down the uh, the end here. But this is a whole lot more close for comfort than I think Bayern Munich folks thought that it was going to be at this point. And that's a good thing. Not only that's not only good for Bundesliga, uh, but that's good for the teams involved here. So Bayern Munich will host Union Berlin. In a highly anticipated showdown, the first league meeting this season in Berlin ended 1-1. Becker and Kimmich with the goals. We'll see what Union Berlin can do here. I, I hope they show up and play well. I don't want it to be one of these deflating games. We had this all the time when we covered the Bundesliga where we would build something up and then Bayern would be up 3-0 at the half and you feel stupid for doing so. But I mean, if you're, if you're really a legitimate contender, then this is the type of game, if you're Union Berlin, this is the type of game that you have to show why and why you keep hanging around so in france also a highly anticipated showdown a top of the table clash between two arch rivals marseille will host psg the gap between those two teams five points right now psg in first place marseille in second a couple of weeks ago marseille claimed a 2-1 home win over psg in the coupe de france we'll see if they can do the same here which would blow the league on race wide open the first league meeting this season was 1-0 PSG at the Parc de Prince. Neymar with the only goal. Neymar out He's with gone, an ankle right? injury. Yeah. But Messi and Mbappe. Have they said how long Neymar's out? I haven't seen anything okay. official. But he was he was stretchered off the other day. So, yeah. okay. Yeah. 
Looks like he might miss that second leg, which is bad news for Bayern. Okay. Uh, I'm just kidding. Yeah, being, know, being cheeky there. I know. It's a little cheeky. Yes. Uh, switching gears to Spain, uh, Real Madrid will host Atletico Madrid in the Derby there. Uh, first league meeting this season, Real Madrid won 2-1 away to Atletico. Rodrigo and Valverde with the goals. Also, about a month ago, Real Madrid eliminated Atletico Madrid in the Copa del Rey with a 3-1 home win. Rodrigo, Benzema, and Vinicius with the Real Madrid goals on that day. We'll see what they can do here. Atletico playing well lately. Four wins and one draw in their last five La Liga games, conceding very few goals in that stretch. While guys like Morata and Griezmann and Memphis Depay, who joined them in the winter, have been knocking them in. So, interesting one. Real Madrid looking to cut into that eight-point deficit. Barcelona are away to Almeria. All right, so Barcelona's going to win. Real Madrid's going to win. Nothing's really going to change in terms of the uh, back and forth between Barcelona and, and Real Madrid. Atletico Madrid is eh, three, four points clear of Betis for that Champions League spot. So they just got to solidify, solidify that. All right, yeah, I mean, the reason why we care about the Bundesliga is there is actual title race and people going back and forth and they're jockeying for position. And yeah, there are to a certain extent jockeying for position here, but it's not as interesting as what's going on in the EPL and what's going on in Bundesliga. In Italy, uh, runaway league leaders Napoli away to Empoli, which should be no problem. We'll see if Chucky Lozano can build off his excellent Champions League performance. Incidentally, we talked about Lozano versus Pulisic. Forgot to mention Tottenham hosts Chelsea this weekend in England. I did see some photos of Christian Pulisic back in training. Bearded. So, a bearded Pulisic, Evan. Yeah, so his know. return. When he grows the beard, there. you know that he's going down. Yes, uh, but so Napoli uh, should pick up another three points here. One bonus one in Italy, AC Milan hosts Atalanta. Top four implications there. So that's the weekend in Europe. Lots of good games. All right. Wonderful, uh, wonderful games to watch. We will be watching as many of them as humanly possible. Uh, anything else? That's it. All right, let's take a, another quick break. When we come back, it's time for Ask Alexi. Okay, welcome back. It's time for Ask Alexi, that part of the show where you send in your questions. Use that hashtag, Ask Alexi, or you call us on our State of the Union podcast hotline, which is 657-549-2297, 657-549-2297. We're running a little bit long today, so we're just going to take one question, and I think we got a voicemail, right, Mossy? Yep, let's hear it right now. Hey, guys, this is Jimmy from Greensboro, North Carolina. Love the podcast. You guys hooked me during the World Cup, and I look forward to it twice a week. My question is about the financial structure of MLS. One of my problems with the European leagues is the competitiveness. You have the grotesque disparity in the payroll between the very few top and then the, the rest. And one thing I love about MLS is their attempt to keep some parity. My question for you guys is about the DP and the GAM and the TAM. Could you guys give us a Cliff Notes version, maybe a synopsis of how that works and how the MLS is using this to try to keep it level, to try to make an attempt at at parity? Uh, once again, guys, thanks a lot, uh, and keep doing what you're doing. Take care. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jimmy. Uh, all right. So where, where to start? So first off, um, you know, I think we've, we've talked about it on numerous pods that MLS's structure is unique relative to the rest of the world. And there are those that like it. There are those that don't. But I think in general, for, uh, for people that have an open mind and people that are honest and smart, they can at least look at the structure that MLS has put in place and recognize that the structure in particular is one of the reasons, and I would argue the reason, why Major League Soccer has been around for almost 30 years. And like I said, you can agree with it, you can disagree with it, but in order for them to have the single entity system, in order for them to have the restrictions when it comes to... Um, players on the field, what you can pay them, how many that you have, you know, the draft system, all this, all this kind of stuff that has made the league sustain. And in many cases, not just survive, but thrive when it comes to, you know, the, the specifics, you know, designated players, this was something that as the league grew, there was a recognition that 
you can't eat, keep everybody down at the same level. And there has been a separation. There has been a situation where you have, we can call them the haves and have nots. But the reality is, as we sit on the eve of yet another season, every MLS club can look at their team, even the ones that it's very obvious are not spending as much as others. And you need look no further than someone like the Philadelphia Union and say, my team has a chance. Maybe it's, it's less than others, but relative to the system, you can say my team has a chance to win MLS Cup. And there's not a lot of leagues, as a matter of fact, there's almost none that can say that. In most other leagues, you get up on the eve of your new season and you say, this is where we're going to finish relative to the realities of the financial ra- realities that we have and the structure that our league uh, employs. You know, we're going to be fighting for relegation. We're going to be a mid-level team and maybe we'll push to possibly get into Europe when it comes to Europa or something else. Or we're one of the, el- the elites and we are pushing to make sure that we solidify our spot when it comes to, uh, to Champions League. And that's really ultimately what happens. A designated player uh, rule came about in the uh, in the mid aughts when David Beckham came about, where everybody recognized that curtailing and hurting the ability of owners to spend money on the product as they see fit and spend money on players that they want to bring in because they believe it's going to make, by the way, not just their business better, but in doing so make the entire business better and the collective, which is important in a single entity, giving them the opportunity to do that. And so the designated player came uh, along. Now we've since had not just an increase in the number of designated player spots where ultimately that money is being paid by the actual ownership as opposed to the league in the collective, But we've also had young DPs come along. We also recognized that the interaction and the trading and the commerce that goes on within a league is important. And as the league evolved and grew, you knew you you were going to have to have money that, you know, for lack of a better word, was particular to Major League Soccer. And that's where the GAM and TAM types of things come. And I'm not going to go through all of the different ways that GAM and TAM are used. But basically, this is money within a league that is able to be used for specific purposes. And that specific purpose can be relative to a player. It can be relative to a time. It can be relative to age, nationality, whatever. It could be a a million different things when it comes to, uh, to what's going on. And it can be traded. And it can be very, very valuable. And we've seen that value fluctuate as it's, as it's gone on. Does it make it more complicated and complex? Yes. Is there a call for much more clarity and transpar- transparency when it comes to Major League Soccer? Yes. But keep in mind that one of the things that has been important since the beginning of this league is to give the league flexibility to do things and not to be so stringent and strict with the rules that if and when something comes up that is going to benefit the collective, that is going to benefit the league, that you are so strident and so closed that you don't have the flexibility to do things. Now, it's actually become a whole lot more strict in terms of implementing the rules and regulations that they have. It's not as willy-nilly as it was in the past, but there is still wiggle room. There is still flexibility that is built into the structure that Major League Soccer employs. Now, to, to, uh, to our friend Jimmy here, you know, you can make your own decision. And I think one of the reasons why Jimmy likes Major League Soccer is because of the structure and he equates the fact that there is so much competition and then there is so much relative par- parity, re- like I said, relative to the rest of the world. That's one of the things that attracts him to the sport. There's others that say, no, we want to let these owners do whatever the hell they want, spend as much as they possibly want, have that gulf occur that happens around the world and let the chips fall there, fall where they may. Now, this is not going to be a, a pro-rel type of situation discussion that we're getting into here, but there's plenty of people that also say that the structure of the league in that single entity with, without having promotion relegation is one of the things that they have a problem with or they think is holding is holding the league back. Mossy, I'll, uh, I'll let you uh, chime in as, uh, as I get off my soapbox there, but I got a little bit more soaping to do. No, just to put some numbers to what uh, you're talking about. Bayern Munich have won 10 straight Bundesliga titles. They're going for 11 in a row this season. 
Juventus recently won nine Serie A titles in a row. PSG have won eight of the last 10 Ligue 1 titles. While in MLS, last 10 seasons, nine different clubs have won MLS Cup. And that is by design, and that is championed by the leadership of MLS. And it obviously attracts people because Jimmy recognizes that this is something different. This is not about him supporting a team that he knows because they have the lack of finances and the lack of ambition, that they are only going to get so going to get so far. And as I said, there has been a separation. Um, you know, when it comes to the success of Major League Soccer, I'm often accused of being, you know, in the bag and a shill for Major League Soccer and all that. And look, I I readily admit that I am biased. That I wear my love of this league on my sleeve. Having said that, I don't care if it's Major League Soccer or USL or any league out there, uh, or any individual team, or by the way, any individual structure, I want soccer to succeed in my country. I want each and every market, wherever it is, to be as expansive, to be as influential, to be as relevant, um, to be as robust as possible. And so I'm not going to demand that it come through Major League Soccer. If Major League Soccer is that conduit, and so far, Major League Soccer has proven that if you have a Major League Soccer team, what happens in your market is on a much bigger level and therefore impacts and affects more people. That's the one right now that does that. If there comes something else that can do it better, absolutely I will support that. And I, because I'm not going to say MLS just should be the only way that we should succeed. And the only way that I want soccer to succeed is, is MLS. No, it's not, that's not the case at all. I just want soccer to succeed. And whether it's in my old hometown of Detroit, where I'm a a very small, but still an owner of my Detroit city FC, uh, and the possibility of an MLS team coming to Detroit at the expense of Detroit city FC, I would love for it to happen. I'd love for MLS to come to Detroit. I would love for it to be in conjunction with an existing product that exists there, an existing uh, team that is a part of that community. But if it doesn't, it's still okay with me because I want soccer to succeed. And more kids are going to get the opportunity to play. The bigger the tent is and the bigger the power is and the bigger the money is, the more that brand is going to expand and therefore the more soccer is going to, uh, going to expand. So... You know that I, I know I digressed a little bit there, but you know, Jimmy, your question made me think about a lot of different things when it comes to what this league is, what it was way back in the day, where Jimmy and maybe many others were not around, and what it's going to be going forward. We don't know ultimately what's go- what it's going to be. You know, we uh, you know we we talked to uh, Taylor Twelman about the future of Major League Soccer and about the expansion and the different teams that are that are coming in. And Major League Soccer may look very, very different in the future. Or who knows? Maybe somebody invents a better mousetrap going forward and comes along and says, you know what? We're going to do things bigger and better, and it's going to make even more of an impact. And like I said, I'm fine with that. If it's Major League Soccer, great. If it's somebody else, that's cool too. Because at the end of the day, all I care about is that soccer continues to explode and to evolve and to be a possibility and to create pathways for all of those kids that are playing and all of those fans that are there and all the potential fans that we have. That's it. All right. Thank you, uh, Jimmy. Uh, For those of you that want to follow Jimmy's lead and leave a message on our State of the Union podcast hotline, again, it's 657-549-2297. Or you can just send us a tweet. Uh, using that hashtag Ask Alexi on all of our different social media platforms. And by the way, our handle for all of our social media platforms is SOTU with Alexi. All right, we're going to take another quick break. When we come back, it's the end of our show, and I'll give you my one for the road. Okay, welcome back. It's the end of our show, and at the end of each and every show, I give you my one for the road. Uh, Mossy, uh, did you uh, did, did you hear uh, Crystal Dunn? She did a, uh, a big interview over there with uh, uh, GQ Magazine uh, online, and she had a lot to say about her her situation relative to the national team. I know you've been checking it out over there. Give, give the folks just an overview so they understand what we're about to talk about here. Well, she's commenting on the fact that she has to toggle back and forth between playing a more attacking position for her club and playing as an outside back for the national team. Uh, 
She said, this camp was especially hard. I came off of a championship. I came off of playing this attacking role. And then I come back here and I don't get to do any of that anymore. It's hard to switch that off. It's not easy. She then added, I feel like I could be that much better as a center mid or as a forward, but I have to split half of my season to outside back, or I could be such a better outside back, but I don't play outside back in the league. I constantly feel like I'm losing a piece of myself wherever I have to commit my energy and time to. Hmm. So if you if you read this GQ uh, article, it's, it's actually fascinating. And Crystal Dunn, just so everybody knows... Um, Arguably my favorite player on the team for a lot of the things actually that she's talking about here. Uh, she is world class when it comes to that left back position. And she's a left back in name only because she has given an incredible amount of freedom to uh, to go forward. Now, what what she is saying here, part of me understands that there is a frustration. There is a frustration for a player that obviously loves to attack and wants to attack. And from a national team perspective, is being put in a uh, defensive uh, position, which she has made her own. And as we said, and as Vlatko Andonovsky, her coach, said, she is world class at. I mean, you need only look back at the incredible performances that she had in the uh, in the last World Cup, and hopefully many more to come this summer. But you go in GQ, and you talk like this, and you know she's come out of. Uh, pregnancy and the wonderful story of her coming back and being back with the team and scoring goals and doing all of this stuff. That's, that's wonderful. But you talk like this in a national forum and these, the, the women, when it comes to the, our U S uh, women's national team have plenty of platforms in national forums. So this is not their first rodeo. You know, by saying these things that they are going to make news, which is why we are talking about it here. We are a few months away from the World Cup, Crystal Dunn, I think, is certainly going to be in the mix. Yes, there is another generation coming forward. But Crystal Dunn playing a position that she doesn't like or doesn't play in a club perspective is nothing new uh, in the game or in the international game. There are plenty of players, both men and women, over the years that have had to adjust to accommodate to a national team. And I really actually thought it was good and maybe really strategic and smart on Vladko Anonofsky's part to kind of come back because he was asked about this at the She Believes Cup and to kind of come back and say uh, that obviously she's a world-class player, as I said, but she has a choice. She can compete at the midfield, though she has to compete with Rose Lavelle and Lindsay Rand and Katarina Macario when she comes in. So if she doesn't feel comfortable playing left back, or she doesn't want to be left back, nobody's forcing her to play that position. As left back, she is world class, like he said, and probably one of the best left backs in the world. As a midfielder, she has pretty steep competition in that position. And that's really what it comes down to. And I think that Vlakonovsky has a, <laughs> a real challenge on his hands. Yes, he has the number one team in the world going for yet another World Cup. But he has to make sure that he keeps people happy. And these are players that are, like we said, some of the best in the world, have had incredible success, have huge egos and personalities in a good way, not in a bad way, in a good way. And he has to make sure that the dynamic stays for this group. And so him kind of asserting himself in this moment and that leadership without completely crushing Crystal Dunn, I think that's leadership and I think that that is good coaching. And Crystal Dunn, as I said before, you're a big girl. You know that when you say these types of things in a national publication, they are going to make news, even more so because of the star that you are and the team that you play on. And so you should absolutely expect this type of stuff to happen. But you are no different than, as I said, players that have come and gone before you. Uh, on the women's national team, on the men's, women's side, in club game, you adjust and you figure it out and nobody is guaranteed a spot. And, you know, I've, I made the transition from an attacking player who I thought I was to a defender. And there's plenty of players out there that have, uh, that have done that. But I only bring this up because of how much love and respect I have for Crystal Dunn as a player and how important she is, but also 
the fragile dynamic that exists for this team, partly because of the incredible platform that they have and what Vladko is going to be faced going forward into a World Cup where he's going to have to make changes and he is going to try to change the way that this team looks on the field. And that is not always going to uh, going to be easy. And so it's a really interesting article. I think you should check it out. And we've had Crystal Dunn on the uh, on the program before, and she is a an incredible athlete and an incredible person, and has you know beliefs and an ego just like anybody else. But it was interesting to see this play out publicly, and for her to very honestly and openly talk about how much this obviously irritates her, but that Vladko or anybody else would look at it and say why are you complaining? I don't think she should be surprised when that type of reaction uh, reaction happens. And so, um, you know, I just thought that I'd finish it up with, you know, again, another reference to the dynamic of teams and how difficult they can be and how one little thing, whether you realize it or not in the moment, can cause major problems down the line. And I think what Vodko did here was deal with that now and not let this fester, not let this, from a public perspective, get out where he justifies what she is saying in terms of his decision on where to play her, and not just his, but previous coaches' decisions where they have played her, because you don't want to let that fester and then have that come at the worst possible time, which is going to be at summer. I get it. Crystal Dunn doesn't like playing left back, but... She's world-class at it, and there's no one better. And unfortunately for her, if she wants to play more higher up on the field, there's better players. And so it's a question of, do you want to start for your national team at left back, or do you want to risk that you're going to be a substitute playing higher up on the field, or not even being a part of the team? Because your value might change dramatically in terms of the way that you are perceived by your coach if you say, I only want to play in a certain position. And there's plenty of players out there that would give <laughs> you know what in order to have just the opportunity to step on the field at any position. All right. Anything else, Mossy? That's it. As we wrap up taping, it is still nil-nil USA-Brazil. So I'm going to go watch the second half of this one. Well, that's good. You know, the U.S. getting a, uh, a good game and being challenged is an important thing whether it involves Crystal Dunn or not going forward. All right. Uh, we will talk to you again uh, next week. Keep downloading and reviewing and rating and doing all the different, uh, different things. Uh, I am heading off to Paris, my friend. Uh, yes, the, uh, the FIFA Best Awards are happening in Paris on Monday. And so I am going to get on a plane on Friday and head off to Paris and be a guest of FIFA over there and uh, see all the mucky mucks and see all the stars there. And uh, but to be clear, you're not nominated for anything. Well, how dare you? Yeah, I'm just I'm nominated for being awesome. Podcaster of the not year. really nominated, just kind of perpetually recognized for my awesomeness. And so therefore, if there's a party, they want me there. Perhaps a lifetime achievement. Award. Lifetime achievement yeah. for awesomeness. Yes. Uh, yeah. So we're going to be there. But I am going to be uh, hopefully uh, zooming in for our first show next week, and then I'll be back next week to do our uh, second show. So wish me luck, mon ami. All right. Uh, we will see you again uh, next week. We will hear uh, from you again next week. So keep sending us in all those questions. And a special thanks again to uh, Taylor Tolman for joining us here on the State of the Union podcast. And go check out all the action this weekend when it comes to MLS and the kickoff of the 28th season of Major League Soccer. All right. Until then, and as always, size the day.